Okay, so Mark has tasked me to introduce another SPH code this week, and originally I was going to use Gadgets, which is the one that we use in our group. Um, but our, imp our group's implementation of Gadget is a bit of a mess, to be honest, and uh, it's also not a very flexible code. It don't, doesn't come with very many features inside it, and so we decided um, to go with a different code called Serin, and I'll be introducing that to you in just a few moments. The other point of this week um, from my side is to give you an overview of roughly how to do um, chemistry in in some sort of code. Okay, in this in this um, week, I'll be focusing very much on how to do chemistry in SPH, but a lot of what I'll be saying today also um, extends itself to doing it in a grid as well. Okay. So the summary of the week, just as Jim did as well, I'm going to give a brief summary of what I'll be talking about. Um, uh, today, I'm going to be introducing the code. Um, CERN, like I said before, and some basic ideas how to do chemistry in, um, in a fluid code. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be kind of showing the details of how to do the chemistry, so we're actually repeating a lot of what I say today. So if you don't really catch what's going on today, don't worry. I'll be repeating it again tomorrow and filling in some details. Um, and Wednesday, I'm going to, so we're going to, tomorrow I'm going to give you a kind of a brief introduction of how to do just an H2 plus and, sorry, H2 and H plus um, chemistry inside, inside code, okay? So in this case, it's going to be Saren. Uh, and Wednesday, I'm going to be um, showing how to maybe make that a little bit more feature rich, including stuff like CO, um, better ways to treat the shielding, because I mean, chemical uh, reaction rates depend very much on how many um, photons are there to dissociate your molecules. And so um, we're looking at some ways to treat the shielding and also how to treat optically thick line cooling, which is important for doing the ISM and for population three star formation. On Thursday, um, we'll be going on to looking at um, population three star formation and the role that chemistry and cooling plays in that. Okay, so a different regime entirely, star formation. And on Friday, I'm going to be um, discussing some SPH add-ons. Now, that Friday lecture really hasn't been written at all. Um, if you're interested in hearing something about, uh, about SPH that you haven't heard so far from Tom last week, then please let me know uh, a new feature you've heard about, and I'll try and give a brief overview of it on, um, on Friday, okay? So um, please um, get in touch with me, okay? Okay, um, so what is CERN? It is a code written by David Hubber. When he was, it starts off when he was in Cardiff. David is a Welshman, so um, he picked a Welsh name, and CERN means star in Welsh, because it was used for doing star formation. Um, one of the other reasons why I picked it this week is that it's new. It, it isn't one of these old legacy codes, such as the one I used in my PhD, which was deriv uh, a derivation of Willie Bentz's code. So it's written in Fortran 90, which is nice. And it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's much cleaner than the, the codes that have been passed down through various groups over the years. Um, most importantly for this week, we're at a numerical workshop. You want to be able to play with the little bits inside the codes, and you want to use different flavors of SPH, for example. Um, it has many different flavors of SPH under the hood. And so for terms of the numerical workshop, it, it's good in that sense. It's also uh, maintained at the moment. Um, and can be accessed via Git. There are two versions. I should say the, the version that we'll be probably using this week is in F90. There is a C++ version being written as well, which will supersede the, the F90 version. So that's something to, uh, to watch out for. Um, but for the moment, the F90 version is, is probably the stablest and, and most up to date. So I think we should use that. It has support for MPI and OpenMP. The OpenMP is, is, is well supported at the moment. Uh, the MPI is still. Um, kind of more experimental, you can download it and try it if you wish on the machine. Most things, I think the test problems, for example, should be fine, um, but for other things you might, you might run into problems. The OpenMP should be stable though. And um, also, which is nice, it has several excellent code papers attached to it. Um, the main one is this one here, which is um, come out in 2011, and then there's been various add-ons and new features added over the time, and David has written a bunch of, um, of, uh, of new papers which describe those features in more detail. So what's inside it? Um, why did we pick it for this week? Well, first of all, it has several time integration methods. It has a longer cut of second order, um, which is actually a third order with an embedded second, so you get some idea of the error control in your integration scheme. It also has um, uh, two leapfrog methods. It has the kick drift kick, um, which is using Gadget. It has a drift kick drift as well, um, which Gadget didn't use. The problem with those is they are fast and they are simplectic, but they don't give you any estimate of the error that you've just made in your integration, okay? You can constrain the, uh, the various errors and based on the forces, but you don't actually know what the integration error uh, um, was that your code took. So again, you can play with those and play the tolerances. Um, it also has this nice feature where it can, so SPH normally, um, 
you have different time steps. The particles sit on different time steps, so you, you use them, uh, the code more um, efficiently. Um, that can run into problems if you're doing, for example, blast wave solutions. People have shown that um, some of the particles that are in longer time steps don't get woken up in time, and the shock overruns them, and they don't know anything about it, which is a pain. So um, it has this nice feature where you can limit the time step difference between neighboring particles, OK, and stop that from happening. And that's very easy. You can just switch that on with a, with a compile time option. Um, I mentioned it has different flavors of SPH. It has um, the original SPH that's come out from uh, Monaghan over the years. It also has this new um, grad H um, SPH uh, formalism, which is derived from the from Lagrangian and takes into account the fact that the smoothing lengths can change in SPH, and therefore you should really be accounting for them in the code as well. And it also has this entropy formalism that Fokker Springer uh, includes in, in Gadget, um, which means instead of um, evolving the energy equation, you just you just um, assume you just evolve the entropy, right? So if your PDV work, the entropy shouldn't change, and so nothing should happen. The only entropy that you add to the system should come from your shocks, and so therefore you can very cleanly monitor how much um, shock or diffusion you have in, in the system. Now, okay, so that's there as well. It also has several different smoothing kernels. I think um, uh, Tom Quinn mentioned a few of these last week. It um, has a whole range of them. You can play with them, can, and it, it's, very, um, it's very modular in that sense. And it has various forms of viscosity. Again, you heard a bit about viscosity last week. Um, I think there's only two times of viscosity in there at the moment. You can also play with putting more in as well if you want to. What it does have, um, which I think is unique so far in, in any fluid code that I know of, is that it has an accurate n-body code inside it, OK? Now, SPH, as you probably know, is essentially an n-body code, right? It's essentially a glorified n-body code. It's n-body code where the particles can punch each other, basically, um, and some, somehow manage to kind of um, estimate the fluid properties. Um, but the integration scheme that you're normally using for SPH is a second order, because SPH itself is only second order at best, OK? Um, if you want to do n-body dynamics, for example, clusters or planetary orbits um, around stars in, in stellar systems, um, you need a more accurate code. And David's put in um, a fourth order Hermite scheme into, the, um, into his n-body scheme there. Okay? And that can work alongside the gas. So for example, you can do gas expulsion of clusters with an accurate treatment of the n-body dynamics inside the cluster. Okay? So that's very nice. And I think that, I, I mean, like I say, that's a unique feature to the code. And so I wanted to introduce that to you this week. Um, he's also improved this thing called sync particles. He's got um, um, a more kind of advanced version, which tries to minimize the pressure errors that you make over the boundary of the sync particles, and also tries to take account the fact that you may be transferring angular momentum out from inside the sync particle boundary to the gas outside it. Okay, so it, it, it seems to give more uh, numerically conserved uh, converged results, and so that's also nice. Again, it has several modifications to SPH, like you know the conductivity, etc. And also, it has a bunch of approximations for doing of transfer. Those that have been um, uh, de developed by Dimitri Stamatelis and Duncan Forgan. You've probably seen these in the context of planet formation and brown dwarf formation. You may have come into them. And also has um, um, a heel pixed um, um, style algorithm for doing the photoionization as well. Okay. So there's a bunch of different physics in there, and you're free to play with it. Um, just. Um, Kind of recently, so David was actually hired by uh, uh, Sam Fall, who's a notorious uh, critic of SPH, and um, he was hired to see just how bad is it. Okay, <laughs> so Sam had uh, the idea that what David could do was compare an AMR code. In this case, it's this MG code by Sp uh, Sven Van Lu, um, with his code, which in that case was was CERN as it was being developed, and doing a bunch of test problems. And there's a whole paper developed um, doing various, various um, solid shock tubes and uh, things like these Kelvin Helmholtz, etc. And um, you can go and see it here. And actually, CERN doesn't look too bad. There's the, uh, the AMR on the top and CERN at the bottom. At late times, you get these extra um, instabilities are growing on top of the on top of the roll there, but it's not too bad. Okay. Um, he's also, again, as mentioned, the sync particles. Here's the Boss-Bodenheimer test. Again, these tests are actually come with CERN. You can, um, he's got um, instructions on how to create them. And I think that's something that would be good for you to do maybe uh, this week. Um, but here's the uh, Boss-Bodenheimer test where he was um, playing out this new sync particle algorithm. And he found he got much better in numerical convergence when you use the new syncs as opposed to the old ones. You can also do this test without sync particles and just use this old idea of fixing the smoothing length in SPH. So you get like, um, basically, you, you lose resolution at some point and um, 
it allows the code to keep going for a little bit longer. And so you can play around with that. You can also change the equation of state in the middle um, at high density so that the gas doesn't collapse anymore. And you can, you know, you can test it out and see how it compares to the sink particles. So that's nice. Um, this was kind of cool. So this was the um, the embody. This is the embody paper. So like I say, there's a, a fourth order Hermite scheme in there, um, and David just played around here by um, taking two plumber spheres with gas. The gas is the stuff obviously in the color table, and the red dots in here are the stars. And he just bashed two plumber spheres together, uh, two clusters, and you can see what happens to the stars. The stars obviously pass through each other, and the and the gas gets stuck in the middle. And he was just doing this test just to look at the errors and the energies and seeing if he could handle it. And it seems like it can. Um, so again, that's there for you to play with if you wish. Um, what have you maybe seen CERN doing in science terms? So here's some uh, uh, simulations run by Steffi Valch uh, uh, recently, which was looking at the photo um, evaporation of molecular clouds. She was taking some fractal clouds, putting um, a bunch of stars inside them, little clusters, and watching how quickly the, um, the cloud was evaporated away. Okay, trying to get this idea of what is the star formation efficiency in a GMC. Okay. And she has a whole suite of them there with different fractal indices to begin with and different masses. Um, and that was using the uh, photoionization module that was put into CERN by uh, 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 Thomas Bisbass um, when he was doing his PhD in Cardiff. The other thing which you're probably maybe familiar with um, CERN from was this work by Dimitris Damatelis uh, looking at the fragmentation of protocellar, um, uh, protocellar disks um, when you have these variable accretion rates um, from the central source, and you find that when you have this kind of patchy accretion, you get this fragmentation of the disk. So again, so I, mean, I think Caitlin pointed this out. Actually, she showed this picture actually um, uh, last week. So that's just to point out that was, in fact, done with CERN. OK, how do you get the code? Well, it's available um, via GitHub uh, from this uh, place here. Um, I will actually, uh, over lunchtime, I will add some slides to the end of here as well with instructions on how to download the code and where things are. I've also uploaded some things as well. Um, and you can then download it from my website, OK? So um, just so you can, you can play with it yourself. Uh, but yeah, it's available on GitHub. Yeah? GitHub is undergoing a DDoS right now, so it's really, really slow to download. OK. That's good to know. I'll try it during the during lunch break and see if it speeds up. OK. But thanks. OK, so like I say, my, this is my, it's my website again. I'll put probably, I think Jim and I are going to have a, maybe five minutes in the afternoon where we discuss what you could be doing this afternoon. So maybe I show this slide again um, so you can get my, get my website, so you can pull down the, um, the stuff. It's actually not there just now, I just wanted to say. <laughs> so if you're looking for it now, you won't see anything. Okay. Um, so CERN also has a bunch of... Um, formats for doing the initial conditions and the snapshots. Um, it has a native file format, so like um, Jim was saying, it's sometimes best not to rely on things like HDF5 and stuff. It's best to kind of write your own. And David has done that for CERN. It's more complicated and a little bit confusing to use. Um, so CERN also has um, a very simple ASCII column format. Basically, it just has like a particle x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z, etc., which you can then read yourself. And then you can quite easily just plot the particles with GNU plot or something to make sure they're okay. Um, so that's that's there, and I think that's probably the best thing for us to use this week because it's um, it's a little bit simpler. Um, I've uploaded. Um, so CERN does come with an IC generator. You can um, you can you can run it in various. So it's described in, in the user manual. You can run it to create various initial conditions, and um, by combining the different um, uh, initial condition generators, you can then create initial conditions that you want. I've also uploaded a very simple um, IC generator onto Hades. It's in my home space. I'll check the permissions from that this uh, during lunchtime as well which you're free to use and then play with and, and download yourself and maybe add, add some features to it. There's also some Turbulent Cubes will be available uh, also in this directory. Um, so you can, uh, they, they can be read by this initial condition generator. If you just wanted to create like um, a turbulent box for doing some turbulence and maybe some um, star formation inside, OK? So that'll be there. So the goal of the week, um, <laughs> should you choose to accept it, is to try to put CO chemistry into CERN. So what I've done is I've written a one zone code for doing the chemistry and the cooling. What that is is if you give it a density, an initial energy, 
it will then work out the and the initial chemical abundances. It will then iterate over a time step to give you the new energy and the new chemical abundances over that time. Okay? At the moment, it only includes H2 and H plus chemistry, and it's got some simple ISM physics in there to get the heating and cooling. Your goal, if you, if you want to, is to try and include a very simple prescription for CO chemistry, which I'll be discussing on Wednesday, and you can play with putting that in if you want. Okay? I should say I've not optimized this one zone code at all. There are many, many calls in the one zone code to things like temperature, um, which can be tabulated if you want to begin with. I've not done that to make it easier to read. If you wanted to use this code in earnest later on, you could then take it away. I'm quite happy for you to do that. And you could then optimize it yourself. Okay? But you can also do that this week, and I can sit down and, and help you. There are things that, um, as we come on to, as we come on to see during the week, pardon me, the chemistry is very sensitive to how you estimate the shielding, how, how well that computational um, zone is, is shielded from the interstellar radiation field. Okay? And there's various ways of estimating that. At the moment, I've taken a very simple one. I said there's a density, the particle has a density, and I fix a length scale, and that just gives you a column, okay? So it's not, it's not particularly useful for doing things like turbulence, because it doesn't really take into consideration the fact that the, that the system has much more complexity there, okay? So again, if you want to use um, a better treatment of the shielding, I will help you do that over the week, okay? And you can also do things like have live dust temperatures. At the moment, the dust temperature in the code is fixed. Um, alternatively, um, what you can do is you can continue with what you were doing last week, looking at, I think some of you were looking at the Boss-Bodenheimer test, is that right? Um, no, I didn't see any nods. Um, yes, you were, okay. <laughs> oh, you have a question, or were you saying yes? Okay. Um, so that was been done with uh, Ramses, yeah? No, I did, I did it with Trump. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> So Patrick was, uh, was actually kind of keen that people might do it with Ramses or uh, Athena, and then we can test out. Okay, so if you want to just play with the code to use it as a test problem, um, you know, that's also fine. And I'll be on hand to help you do that as well. Okay. Also, if you want to use some of the new features, like using the M-body stuff, then um, please let me know. And we can also do a project there. Okay, so I'm going to leave it as open as possible for you. The, what I'd like you to do is the top one, but you know, I'm, I'm, I realize that not everybody's interested in chemistry, right? So, <laughs> and um, you, know, the, you, you might want to keep certain things going from last week as well. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm going to give a talk now which is kind of based on one that Simon gave. Simon Glover is my collaborator in the Heidelberg. He gave it impressed. I should say that Simon actually is the chemical whiz kid here. It's not, it's not myself. I actually should make a confession here. I hate chemistry, right? And I always have. I hated it in school. And then I got into, um, into doing it in pop free star formation and I realized that actually it's very useful. And um, in some cases, you can't avoid it, depending on the subject that you want to study. So I've been reluctantly dragged into it. And um, I've actually found it more uh, enjoyable, I must confess, than I was expecting to begin with. Why is it important? Why should we be studying chemically reactive flows? OK, so in pop the star formation, which is where I go introduced to it, um, the cooling of the gas, so, so here, for example, is a, is a it's a phase diagram from Naoki Yoshida's work. So basically what he was doing, he was looking at the collapse of a gas cloud inside, say, a dark matter mini halo that was going on to form a pop three star, from, um, pop three star in the early universe. Okay, so around about a redshift, around about 20, the gas in that mini halo was collapsing. And what's happening to it? Okay, so you can't do the evolution of that problem unless you follow the chemistry. Okay, because the chemistry, does, I'll be showing this plot in much more detail on, on Thursday, the amount of cooling that you have and the temperature at all these points is based on the amount of molecular hydrogen you have. Okay? That's key. Okay? And if you get the molecular hydrogen amount wrong, or you make an error in it, or you try to assume it's all in equilibrium, you will get the wrong answer. Okay? So you have to do the live chemistry in the code if you're to, do, if you're to study that problem. Okay? So that's, that's a case where the, where the chemistry is important for the thermodynamics and the physics of the problem you're trying to actually simulate. Okay? But that's not, always, that's not always true. For example, in the ISM, in present-day star formation, the chemistry plays almost no role at all. Okay? Most of the cooling is done by C plus okay, in the ISM. And here's a, a, a plot from a paper that Simon and I did a couple of years ago, where we kind of we, had, we have this chemical model, we can then play with it, and we can say, well, let's see what happens if I switch on H2 chemistry or CO chemistry, and let's see what happens if I don't switch on at all. And we found that you get you know, pretty much the same temperature density diagram coming out. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. There are slight differences here to do with how, how, how broad they are. So these bumps and things. Most of those bumps are probably not really physical in a sense. They're just because we use a, cer a certain initial conditions. Um, but you don't really need it. Okay, so you can get the same star formation rate. Probably the IMF doesn't really change either if you were to. Sorry. Sorry, I missed. What did you say? Control it instead of the chemistry? 
C plus cooling. Okay, so this slope here is set by is set by two things. It's set by the balance between C plus cooling and the shielding of the gas from the photoelectric emission from the dust grains. Okay, so it's purely due to shielding and cooling. So the balance between those two gives you this slope. Okay, at high densities you're thermally coupling to dust. Okay, so again. It's so irrelevant to the chemistry, okay? So you can switch on CO, for example. Everyone says, oh, molecular clouds are cold because they're, because they're, because they're molecular. It's actually not true, right? So <laughs> that's kind of a misnomer. So why would you do all this chemistry if, you're, if you don't really need it for getting things like the star formation rate right and the IMF right? Well, it turns out if you want to connect to the observations, you then have to do the chemistry, right? So here's um, um, a bunch of simulations we did um, starting molecular or atomic to begin with, or well, probably the other way around. Um, and, and then we dropped the, um, uh, the metallicity, so it changes the amount of shielding, changes the over amount of, uh, the amount of carbon, the amount of oxygen we have in the system, and we just scaled them down from solar metallicity. And then you watch what happens when you look at the, um, the CO emission you get from that cloud, you see it drops like a stone, okay? Just, just disappears. And so if you want to be able to say, well, how do the star formation rates in galaxies compare to the CO that I measure, then suddenly the, the, the chemistry starts to become very important again. Okay? And the reason why you have to do the chemistry in both these cases, both in the, in the primordial case and also in the present-day star formation case, is that these tracers are typically not in chemical equilibrium. Okay? Okay, the reaction rates are kind of going slower than the system is, okay? so they have to catch up. And so I can't just say, what is the equilibrium value for the CO at this point? I'll probably get the wrong answer. What is the equilibrium value for the H2 at this point? Again, I'll probably get the wrong answer. Okay. Um, so it's important that you have some way of doing them inside the code if you want to study these uh, particular problems. So how do you do it in the code? So what are the governing equations? So um, here's the equation here for the evolution, the number density of a species I inside a zone in your code. Okay, so say one cell or could potentially one SPH particle, but we see the, the, the equation changes considerably when you come to SPH for the better. So, um, <laughs> but let's say it's just for, for one zone inside your computational volume. Okay? So you have the rate of change is being given by, you have some, um, you have the convective derivative here, so you can flux um, species in from neighboring cells. And there's also diffusion um, terms, so you know, not just velocities, but you know, there's kind of a thermal uh, diffusion there. You can also have that process going on, especially if you have very sharp gradients in the density um, distribution of your, of your species. And on the other side, you have these source terms and destruction terms. So C here in the, in, in the rest of the lecture will be the creation rate of, of that particular species, which tends to depend on the density of the species itself, the density of some collider or um, catalyst, if you like, depending on what's going on, and the temperature of the gas. Okay. There's also a destruction term, which is also trying to get rid of it. So you're not just creating it, you're also destroying it in a sense as well. And that tends to depend only on, um, so the destruction term tends to depend on the, on the rate, sorry, the density of, of, of some sort of collider or some other uh, process, the temperature, and it's proportional to the density of the thing you're trying to get rid of, right? That makes sense. So that it's, it's important to realize, actually, in, in this equation, the density of the species here appears on this side of, of, of the equation for the destruction term. It doesn't really appear in there. It may appear in some functional form inside it, but it's not linearly proportional to it. Okay. Okay. So that density is always there. Okay. So you get these three different processes which are trying to change um, the d the number density you have of that particular species. You have advection, you have diffusion, and then you have the chemical reactions on on, on the right hand side. Okay. Um, it depends on the type of destruction and the type of creation you have. You will always have, um, the, the creation term might not depend at all on how much um, of one species you have, of the actual species you have in, in general, depending on which regime you are. As you get close to being fully H2, then obviously it does, right? But in, in some regime it may, it, it may not. You're probably going to depend on some collider here as well, because you're, you're kind of collect, or some catalyst, um, and then you're going to depend on the temperature. In this side, the destruction term, I can only destroy what I've already got. Okay, so that's fixing that amount. And so that becomes a separate, that comes outside. Okay, because you're destroying what you already have. Okay. Is that clear? Clearer? Okay. <coughs> so the diffusion term, um, 
is one that we tend to ignore in most, <laughs> we tend to normally uh, ignore some sort of explicit uh, diffusion in most astrophysical problems. Um, and in the chemistry, we can kind of, t we can tend to ignore it as well from, uh, from most regimes. Diffusion length scale is just given by um, diffusion coefficient times, t times time to the power of a half. Diffusion coefficient um, goes to the length, uh, the, the mean free path times the thermal velocity. And if you look through the, uh, the mass for the ISM, um, for number density of 1 t of, uh, t of 10 to the 4 Kelvin, you find the diffusion um, uh, length scale is around about a parsec. Okay? So you diffuse about a parsec in 10 mega years. Okay? That's not very, not very far and quite a long time. Now, for certain problems, if you're just looking at a fixed patch of, of something, that may, that may become an issue. And also remember, it does depend um, a little bit on the gradients here as well of the species. But we tend to ignore it for the most part when we're doing chemically reactive flows. And what I'm going to say um, for the, it's, it's, used, it's ignored typically in the POP3 star formation case, and it's also tends to be ignored in the, in the ISM case. But like I say, there can be situations where you might need to put it back in again. Um, we're not going to discuss it this week. Okay. So your reaction, um, uh, the equation governing the, 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 the rate of change of, of, of the density of, of your reactant then drops down to um, something that involves just the flux the flux in, and just the creation and destruction. And you see, the way it's written here, what you're tending to do is you kind of split these two in your code. OK, it's something called operator splitting, which I, mean, I think we've just been introduced to and why you shouldn't use it in certain uh, situations. In, MH, in, sorry, in, um, in chemistry, it's used very commonly. And the reason why is that it's very difficult to couple the creation and destruction to the live fluxing that you're having in the code. One's involving a complex Riemann solver often, and this one's involving a separate set of reaction species. Okay? So you tend to always separate the two of them out into these separate parts, and you do them at different steps um, within the time step. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the drawback to object splitting is the introduce an extra error, um, but something you have to um, take care of. And then depending on the, the type of, of splitting you do, then controls the, the size of that error. Uh, the simplest way of doing the splitting is obviously to do this kind of simple strategy where you just evolve the advection from T0 to T1. Using the output from the advection step, you evolve the reaction from T0 to T1. Okay. And um, you, can obviously swap the, uh, you can also swap these two. Typically, because chemical reactions can be stiff, as we'll come on to in a minute, you want to do um, the chemistry towards the end of the step because it means that things which are in chemical equilibrium will then be in the equilibrium by the end of the step. Okay. So you, what's right? What's happening with the diffusion term? Diffusion term we're ignoring because it tends to be small. OK. okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you would, yeah, you would put the diffusion term in along with the advection term. OK. And you split out the chemical reaction and solve separately. OK. But yeah, good, uh, yeah, good point. So that was first order splitting. Obviously, it introduced uh, an error of order of the time step. Um, you can do better using this thing called strang splitting, which I think Jim also mentioned there. Uh, in this sense, what you do is you evolve the reaction network from T0 to T0 plus a half time step. You evolve the advection over T0 to T1, and then you evolve the reaction network for the second part. Okay? And that already gets you kind of a second order. Okay? And you can also do some um, predictor corrector things as well in the half step if you wish. People tend not to. Okay? So you tend to just do them completely separately. Um, I've already said this, you know, if your reaction networks are stiff, which generally they are, you want to be doing um, this update at the end of the step. Okay. okay, so um, how do you invite the species? So you basically, you're piggybacking on the grid codes, if it's, a, if it's a grid code, you're piggybacking on the way that it generally does its invection step for the density, for example. Okay, so you use the same various um, processes that you would use inside your, um, inside your grid code to, to also affect the species. Um, the problem is that you must conserve the total amount of, say, hydrogen. You don't want to be creating and destroying hydrogen, right? You want that to be conserved. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of equations that you have to keep solved. So if you have hydrogen, helium, carbon, that would be three. You've also got electrons and stuff, okay, because they can be knocked off these various different species. So you've got basically four different species that you have to conserve all the time. You have to conserve charge and the, and the initial number of, the, of the, um, the species that you had to begin with. Um, in most Illyrian codes, especially if they're higher order, you're not typically going to conserve the species after you do the fluxes. So imagine you had um, hydrogen, for example, was being fluxed in the form of 
neutral hydrogen, you had a flux, you were, you're also following H2, and so you were following H plus, right? You're going to flux those three things separately from one, from, uh, from one cell to the next. You're not guaranteed that they're going to end up with the same relative ratios by the time they get to that next cell, okay? There's no, there's no coupling of those terms involved. And so you have to then do a correction step at the end to actually get your total abundances back to where they were before. Um, one way you can do that, is very simply, is you can just fix, you can just renormalize the amount of stuff you have in that cell at the end. Um, however, that's been shown that it can be very highly diffusive. And a better approach is instead to advect the fluxes, um, which is called a consistent multi-species advection. And basically, you're constraining, so you're saying that, that the total flux of all hydrogen in those four different bits has to add up to the same thing, okay? So you're kind of conserving it over the, over the flux step rather than doing it afterwards, okay? Jim, is this, this is in Athena, yeah? You have this step? Uh, yes. Okay. It goes, yeah, this is like, it's in Zeus as well. It's in Zeus. It's also in Flash, I think, as well. So, okay. So most of these grid codes, we do have that, so. Yeah. Just so you know, if you're going to implement it, chemistry in one of these other codes, this is kind of taken care of for you already, I think. So you don't have to worry about it. SPH is much, much simpler because we don't do advection as a separate thing. The advection is done by the SPH particle moving from where it was in one time step to its new location somewhere else, okay? So it's one of the few things SPH does, does correctly is that it does <laughs> potentially make zero error in the advection, time set, uh, the advection step, except obviously in the integration error itself. And that simplifies our, um, our reaction equation substantially. Now we just have dm by dt. This time it's Lagrangian. It's not the, um, the convective derivative. And then you just have these creation and destruction terms. Okay? So basically what it means is in SPH, you can just follow the creation destruction on that particle itself and you follow it around. Okay? It's a purely Lagrangian scheme in that sense. Now if you were to put the diffusion back in again, coming back to the diffusion term, then you would then have to take care of how you were doing that. Okay, then you'd have to renormalize the species. Okay? So that is, is potentially an issue. Um, to take a look at this paper by um, Thomas Greif um, in 2009. He was looking at metals being fluxed out from a supernovae that was going off inside a cosmological mini halo somewhere and looking at the metal mixing. He wasn't actually coupling the metals live to the cooling, I don't think, in that sense. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he had to take care of that. Okay? So you can go and see how you would do that if you wanted to. And in some sense, you might obviously then need to operate or operate a split again because you've got that diffusion term in one sense, you've got the chemical reactions in the other. You could, could potentially get back to the sense where you're having to do some sort of strang splitting once more. Okay. But yeah, so in SPH, everything's much simpler. So I mentioned this idea that the chemical reactions are stiff. What does that mean? So it means that you have reaction rates which have very, very widely different time steps. Okay. And you want to move your code from one time set to the next and have everything where it should be at the end of the time set. Um, so the reaction rates are stiff. It's, um, it's obviously a very difficult problem. If you want to solve it explicitly, so um, having you know, the abundance of something at T1 is equal to T0 plus the rate of change of that abundance times the time step, at, at, at all defined at, at, at T0, um, you have to take very, very small time steps. Okay? So one way you can schematically show that is this nice, uh, nice diagram here from uh, Lee and Gear. And basically what they were showing is if there's some sort of um, equilibrium manifold here which you're, you're trying to get close to, if you take, a, you take your step, you're going to bounce yourself off it. Because you're quite close to the equilibrium solution, the time steps, uh, sorry, the, the rates of change of the chemical reaction when, it, when the particle or the cell awakes itself here are going to be very, very small. Okay? And so you have to try and get back to that equilibrium solution again. You're going to have to use tiny time steps to get back. Okay? And typically what you'll find also is you bounce around this thing as well. You can oscillate around it. And then you take another time step and bang, you're off the equilibrium curve again. Okay? So doing that explicitly is very, very difficult. Um, and so the best way, obviously, to do it, the chemical solve is implicitly. So all, chemi all, all chemistry solvers and any kind of, kind of chemical simulations you see are in some way doing an implicit solve under the hood. Okay. And um, one of the simplest ways of doing this is using the first order backwards differencing. Um, it's very easy to see what's, what, uh, what it's doing, so in that sense, it's quite powerful. And basically, what you're doing is you're taking the backwards difference means you're taking the uh, the difference between the time at t1 subtracted by the time at t0 over the time step you're taking, and then you have the collisional times uh, sorry the creation and the um, uh, the destruction terms and the densities are all defined at t1 the solution that you're trying to get to. Okay, so therefore you see you're going to have to iterate because you don't know what these are. 
because you haven't got there yet. Okay, so you're going to have to iterate this equation here. But you, actually, when you rearrange this for T1, you find it takes this following form. And that's quite nice because in this sense, now what you see is that the creation, the creation and the destruction terms are both positive. Okay? Here we had the negative to make the destruction term reduce the amount of the, of, of the species that you have. But when you rearrange it in this form, you find that you have this ratio of the two and both are positive. So you're guaranteed to have a positive result. Okay? So it means you can never get a negative abundance by using this um, form of the iteration. Okay. Obviously, that's very good. So the pros and cons of the backwards differencing is that it is quite simple to understand. It's also extremely fast, right? There's not much there. You don't have to do any matrix um, inversions or anything. And the, um, the solutions are guaranteed to be greater than zero. So that's very good. The cons are that it's inaccurate. It's only first order accurate. And you've got absolutely no idea what the error is, right? Because in a first order solution, you've got no second order solution there to kind of help you figure out what error you just made in, in, in your solve. In practice, what you do to actually to, to get this to work is you would um, constrain that the abundances can only change by a small fraction over the time step, okay, say by 0.1 or something. And that tends to give you then some sort of handle on the error that you're making. I should say that in the, um, in the code that I've put together um, for you uh, in the chemistry solver, it is using this, okay? It's using the first order backwards differencing, okay? So it's using something quite simple. It turns out for ISM chemistry, that's actually fine, okay? At least the ISM chemistry that you'll be using uh, this week. Are there other better ways to do it? Well, obviously, yes. You can use higher order backwards differencing, and there's a bunch of various off-the-shelf packages that you can just download and, and, and include. Um, this is, there are these um, the VODE family, DVODE, et cetera, and this other one here. And um, they, they, they come in C, in C versions, I think, also in, C, in, in Fortran 77 is the one that we actually use in, in, in our gadget implementation. There's also implicit wrong cutter, as you can get this one here from this Esterk, and there's Rosenbock, and there's um, a few other different types. And you can get an overview of how good they are in this um, Sandow um, reference here. By the way, I should say that the references that you see here are also written in full at the end, because these are not, you know, these are journals of chemistry, etc. Okay, or computational physics. So they're more difficult to find on ADS. Okay, so just so you know, they'll be at the end. Um, one thing you have to be careful of when using any high order system is, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit more tricky. There, there are various problems that you can encounter. One of them um, is that it has to. Um, Computer Jacobian. So you have this kind of large matrix of all your rates. You're going to feed it a functional form for those rates so it can work out what the rates actually are at each point in that matrix. Okay. Now, if you if you just download the rates from the, from, uh, from the net, you know, from people's uh, postings online and people have been studying what these rates are, you tend to find that a lot of them actually have discontinuities in, in, in them. Okay. They're only valid over either a small range in density and temperature and potentially. Um, Calm density space, and so you then have to maybe extrapolate or splice something else onto it. Okay, you have to be careful that you don't have any discontinuities. Otherwise, the, co the codes won't be able to compute the Jacobian. Okay, and they will just crash. Okay, so the number one crash that we normally have when we're introducing a new species to our system is that we've got a discontinuity somewhere in our reaction rates, and that kills it. Okay. Um, Marcus Wulig um, actually has um, can I study where he actually takes a lot of the common rates that you would want, and then he actually kind of has functional forms which smooth out the kinks and bubbles, um, which makes that a little bit easier for you, so it saves you doing some work. Um, the other problem is that high order solvers is you're not guaranteed to be positive anymore, right? As, as, um, as Jim was discussing. And so then you need to sandy check your output and make sure that all your reactions are actually positive. If they're not, the typical solution is you call it with a smaller time step and you try to, try to work through it and get the system to do something else. Um, Another problem is that the uh, chemical reaction rates, you kind of pack this thing up in a kind of a somewhat abstract form, and it becomes quite difficult to figure out what's going on. So if you're kind of new to chemistry and you're kind of trying to work out what this particular reaction rate is doing, it's not a very intuitive way of solving the equations. Okay, you might be better off trying the first order uh, backwards differencing to begin with, and then maybe once you think you understand what's going on with the chemical system there, then say, okay, now I move to a more stable um, solver once I understand it. Okay, so that's something to be aware of. What benefits are there? Um, obviously, um, handling new reactions is trivial. Okay, you just have this kind of very abstract form, tabulated form, where you you pack in your reaction rates in, into these arrays, and everything's taken care of inside. You don't have to worry about which reactions are moving faster than other ones. The code will do that for you inside. Okay, so uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about how stiff the reaction is compared to other ones that are already there. 
And the other thing is that it automatically subcycles. What do I mean by that? So you've called your chemistry and you say, I want to go from T0 to T1 over time step dt. Okay. Now the chemistry solution inside, it may not converge over that time step and it may, it may find that it has to take a smaller time step internally in order to satisfy any constraints that you've put in the equations. For example, you may have constrained it such that the, um, like I was saying, that the, uh, the total abundance, the fractional error, is maybe say 10 to the minus 4. The iteration, even in the, in the higher order scheme, may come back and say it's only 10 to the minus 3. OK, OK, I have to go around a smaller time step and do it again. Okay. So what these codes do is they will subcycle and they'll keep doing that over that small, they take small time steps until they get to the time step that you want. Okay? So you don't have to worry about putting in a hierarchy um, um, into your code, a kind of some sort of driver in that sense to keep it subcycling. It will do it for you. Okay? Another benefit is that they are often um, highly optimized and they use um, various different tricks and stuff to, um, to do their matrix inversions. That's nice. And many are also still maintained. So the one that we use, I should, I should actually point out, is not maintained. We're using the DVODE solver, which is the old Fortran uh, 77. The reason we use Fortran 77 is Jim's fault, because that's what Zeus was written in. And Simon wanted to keep everything in the same type, so he used the 77 one. But um, that's fine. I would point out that it was written before Fortran 9 existed, so it's not That's actually true. <laughs> so was this. I think it was written, I think, in the, in the 80s or something. I think this, um, this code. So. I take the blame, but. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, having a cheap shot. Um, but yeah, so, so Simon was originally doing the chemistry in Zeus, so he wants everything to be the same. So um, we haven't updated to the C++ version yet, but um, we should do, probably, because it has extra benefits now as well. Um, OK, how am I doing? OK, a few minutes. Um, so performance-wise, the implicit solver obviously normally requires some sort of Newton uh, iteration that's also trying to invert a matrix inside, and as you know, those things can be, co uh, can be quite costly. Um, the total scaling will go as the number of species that you've got to the cube power, OK, to the third power. And so if you've got reaction rates, if you've got a reaction network, which is very bloated, and you've got lots and lots of reactions in there which are doing nothing at all, you're slowing your system down all the time, because you have to do that entire matrix inversion every time step, multiple times per time step even, to get your chemistry to go from T0 to T1, OK? So the first thing you can do is you can exploit the sparseness of the matrix. What that means is that most of the reactions won't react, most of the, of the species won't react with all the other points um, in the matrix. Okay, there's only a small network. For example, if you have nitrogen there, it doesn't react with very many things. Okay, and so you can um, use solvers which exploit the sparseness of the matrix. Okay, so that's, that's one way around that, and it gives you speed ups of a factor of a few. And there's some examples again. The full references are at the end here if you want to look them up in more detail. Um, the other thing is that, you know, obviously, if the cost goes as n cubed, then if you can reduce that number, then you've, got, you've made a huge benefit, right? <laughs> so that's the easy thing to do. And once you understand your chemical reaction network, you might think, well, you know, that reaction between, you know, I don't know, some CH plus and something else is doing essentially nothing. It's not changing the amount of carbon at all, all right? So, why do I need it? If I'm, if I'm looking for CO uh, information, I can probably just ignore that reaction and take it out entirely. Okay? So this idea of you can reduce your network only to the reactions which are actually doing something useful and changing the abundances by a large amount. Um, the problem is that that's, that's actually um, quite complicated, and you have to kind of look in the density, temperature, and AV space. So the AV member comes back in here because the molecules are dissociated, and the amount of extinction you have then um, uh, affects the amount of dissociation you have. Okay, so you have to really kind of look in this large, um, uh, this large three-dimensional space to figure that out. But again, it's possible to do that. I'll show you some examples actually of that tomorrow, in which that has been done. So um, yes, yeah, so the more you know about the particular problem, you can um, you can make some advances. The problem is that you're trading. Computer time for your time, right? And that's always bad. <laughs> you always want to get the computers to do the work if you can. And so it'd be nice if that could be automatically done in some way, if you could get some sort of computer algorithm to sort through your reactions and say, OK, this one is completely irrelevant, or it's in, it's in chemical equilibrium. I can just assume uh, abundance trivially. And that kind of spawned this thing of um, this computational singular perturbation um, idea, um, which basically tries to say, well, the reaction rates can be expressed as some vector in this n dimensional space where n is your number of, of species. And just by choosing a correct coordinate frame or basis vectors, you can then 
split that vector into the ones which are evolving very, very rapidly and the ones which are evolving more slowly and therefore you then have to um, evolve their uh, abundances uh, uh, much more accurately. And the very rapidly ones you can then say, okay, they're in the chemical equilibrium. I don't need to kind of put them into the matrix inversion. I can just work out what they are at this time based on the number densities of the other species. Okay, so you do that later. And that can um, speed it up substantially. Okay, and again, there's this um, paper by Lamb which introduced this technique for the chemistry. And you can go and see that in more detail. Okay, I'm essentially done, I think. I rattled through that faster than I was expecting. Um, like I say, the talk will be online. Um, and I'll put in the last few slides. I'm going to have basically how you will download Serin and go through the basic steps to get it working and maybe do, for example, the Boss Bodenheimer test. Okay, so that may be a good one to do to start. And you can also do it with different particle numbers and you can play with things like the tree opening angle to increase the accuracy of the gravity. You can also try it using different smoothing kernels, etc. Okay, so that's probably the first thing we'll try. Um, and that will be online after lunch. Okay, thank you. This one here, um, uh, where was it? This one here? Yes. Um, so Bobby can't read it, I don't think, from here, but it's actually using. I know oh it's actually not written on the, on the panels. I think this is using a higher order kernel. This is using the quintic kernel in SPH. And it's also using this um, conductivity, thermal conductivity. So you're actually doing a, a non-Lagrangian step there between the particles and their neighbours to try and fix that pressure blip that you're talking about. Okay? So that's one way of fixing the pressure blip. Um, I don't think it's, well, is that a good one? Um, personally, I think it has to be tuned to the problem, which I don't like. And there are si certain situations where I wouldn't want to see it used because it could actually do something you don't want. Um, so people have come up with different ways of doing this. So Phil Hopkins, who will be here on Wednesday, has this, um, he fiddles with the... Uh, basically with the Lagrange multipliers at the front of the, well not just with the Lagrange multipliers, also with the, um, the weighting fractions you have in the pressure, in front of the pressures in the momentum equation in SPH. And they find that you actually get a better estimate for this as well. So it actually behaves much better and that's maybe a more general fix and then it can pick up the fluid and stabilities if it can resolve them. Does that answer your question? Um, potentially, because it you will know, damp out vorticity, right? So if you can't if you can't resolve it, you will. But then, you know, the question is, I mean, even in the grid codes, when you're doing the turbulence, are you really resolving this most of the time? It's not it's not nicely aligned with the axis, right? It's at some horrible angle. You probably don't have that much resolution um, in certain scales. So it's not always clear that the grid codes are actually picking that out of the turbulence simulations either. Is that a fair comment? Uh, yes, I mean it's certainly true that. Right. And then you can't see it anymore. The question is, for a given computational cost, do you resolve those small scales, you know, better with this pitch or a grid code? And that's an application kind of thing. For some things, I think grid codes will, will be much cheaper to get the same active solution. Others were maybe this page. In this case, I think the SPH is actually much more expensive for this one here. The, the question I had is whether or not, I mean, there are these special fixes that work for these test problems, but <laughs> um, well, that's the problem with the artificial conductivity one is that it's very difficult to figure out what that prefactor should be. So I think people don't, right? Um, there is um, there's a fix that's using gasoline. Um, uh, And then not doing anything else about it. I agree. That was my criticism with Dan Price's fix for the for this particular problem. And I think that one where you're changing the weighting functions in front of the of the the pressure uh, fractions in the momentum equation is a more general fix. And so then, and it's a couple of lines actually to put into the code. So I think that's probably better in general. I don't think it's actually implemented in CERN. Uh, so that's something you could try this week if you wanted. David, I'm uh, sorry, um, Phil Hopkins, who's written a paper on that, uh, more recently will be here on Wednesday as well. I think it's Wednesday. So, um, But yeah, we can sit down together and try and do it if you want.
and then labs this afternoon. Okay. More questions? Are you solving the gravity using tree algorithm? Yes, sorry. Um, there are several different types of tree in CERN. Um, but yes, it's using a tree. It uses, um, there's this Mac thing where it tries to constrain the error in the tree gravity solve. And there's also the original Barnes and Hutt where you're just picking an opening angle. Okay, so yeah, the, uh, the Mac one's better because it actually gives you an error estimate of what you're doing. It's also faster, typically, than using the straight Barnes and Hutt. The Barnes and Hutt one can open up huge patches of sky which have nothing in them, right? Just simply because they, they violated the opening criteria. They might be full of empty space or just one particle. And so, they, so the, the, their contributions to the overall gravity essentially are, are negligible. But yeah, so there's like, at least those two in there, I think. There are questions. Uh, the entropy formalism you mentioned, the, the pressure entropy formulation, Hopkins, Bill Hopkins, talk about? Uh, no, I think it's a, um, no, it's a pressure entropy, uh, it's an entropy formulation from Springer, 2001, I think, 2001. So the one that's in gadgets as standard. Okay, it's actually not entropy, it's an entropic function. It involves obviously pressure over density, but yeah, to some power. But yeah. Um, I want to ask this really question, but what, what could uh, chemical reactions that are called That's not a stupid question, okay, that's, a, that's very important. So, um, at the moment, it just has a bunch of reactions for H2 and H. I'll show you them tomorrow. There's eight. They're actually the ones that are given in, in Simon Glover's paper in 2007, if you want to go and look at it. He was um, doing the chemistry in Zeus at the time, and um, he has these uh, eight reactions that do the H plus and the, and, and, and the H2. But that's all that's in there just now. Um, you can obviously add more if you wish to try and see if it makes it more accurate. And also, I think, which would be fun, is add a very simple prescription for CO, which I'll be discussing on Wednesday. Okay. Agreed. So the, the, the H2 that, I'm, uh, that, that I've put in is the H2 formation on dust grains, okay? So it won't work for primordial gas because there's no dust. That's a different set of reactions, um, uh, ion neutral reactions that take place in, in primordial chemistry which are not in there, okay? Yeah. One more. Yes, yes, there is. Um, so, so that's a good question. There are actually there are two branches. So I've created a, a, a chemistry branch, and there's the original master branch. If you just download the master branch, you won't get any of the chemistry subroutines. They have been checked though, so if they're not hash defined in the make file, they should be switched off. <laughs> but yeah, and then there also is a bunch of different. There's a various range of different uh, equations of state: isothermal, adiabatic, and then piecewise polytropes. If you want as well. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's quite stiff, and they could be nonlinear functions of the temperature and density. Mm. And so then, if you're doing a calculation of some turbulent flow, for example, and you kept changing the resolution, then the fluctuations in density, temperature could be quite different in every different resolution. And then, you know, since the chemistry is such a nonlinear function of those things, you know, that you might worry that that would change the chemistry substantially. And so I guess my, I have a very general comment to about or um, of solutions when you have a complicated hydrodynamical flow for which the chemistry might be sensitive. Mm -hmm. you talk a lot about you know, the presentation of the accuracy of the solver. When they're joined together, it's sort of more issues involved. How there are. That's a good question. Like so from a, new, from a straight uh, coding point of view, uh, we tend to couple the uh, PDV and the shocks into the into the solve as well. So we're solving the energy equation complete, un, uh, completely unsplit, right? So it's, it, it's all going together just for that exact reason that they, are, they can be very sensitive to each other. And so you get a much more accurate solution when you do that. The second thing is you were mentioning, you know, if you had some complicated system, for example, a, a GMC is very turbulent. The density, uh, the H2 formation rate goes as 10 to the 9 years over the number density. And so it's a, kind of, it's a fairly strong function of temperature. And also of shielding and temp uh, sorry, strong function of density and also of shielding. Um, 
And what we find is that, um, so we have actually done some conversion studies, and you do need to have, you know, you need to be, to be resolving, in a GMC, you need to be resolving quite high density peaks if you want to get your CO abundances and the, uh, the H2 abundances correct. H2 is actually much easier because it self shields. The, dent, uh, the CO is, is more tricky. But yeah, you're right. Yep. The, the really nasty one, right, from an is CH plus. Yeah. That's, that's the example because there, there is not. Yeah, because it requires yeah, so it requires a high ionization fraction. It's very sensitive to ionization fractions. So um, that's right. Um, there's also actually so we've actually been finding that um, in these you know we, we we generate these cubes of of CO for example, and then we pass it to a, a line transfer code such as Case Dulimong's Rad MC code, which Stella Offner will be talking to you about next week. In fact. Um, and we find that for certain transitions, then you're also very heavily dependent on the resolution that you have, right? So, for example, the CO one to zero kind of converges at fairly low resolution. So, if you have you know a six parsec box, you got one two eight cube. It's, you're kind of converged. Um, maybe two five six, but is, is is a bit better. Um, the CO two to one, because it comes from these high density peaks, is then very very sensitive to the resolution. And it's actually quite difficult to do the variative transfer problem afterwards. So, yeah. Any more questions? One more. Um, the talks you showed from Nobby, if you use the paper, the, the temperature versus the heat one. Yeah. Um, what are the wires that have to get out of the APC What's going on at the EFG there? At the EFG? Um, but I'll talk more about this on Thursday. I'm going to actually label all these points. But, but I can quite brief, brief say. So here, you've just converted all your H2. All right. All right, so you're starting to convert H2. Um, so you cool slightly because you get a lot of H2. H2 becomes optically thick. The line coulomb comes optically thick, so it starts to rise again. And then you have uh, collision-induced emission cooling. That's when two H2 molecules behave like a super molecule, and you can actually get a continuum uh, emission. And then that becomes optically thick around about G, and then you start to just dissociate hydrogen to cool. Okay. Okay. I'll talk more about them on, on Thursday. <laughs>